Hello, beautiful humans, and welcome to the Mental Wellness Wake Up Show, a weekly podcast where growth minded, creative people come to learn best practices from both spirituality and psychology that create lasting well being. I am your host, mental wellness expert, improvised acting teacher, therapist, and coach, Dawn McMillan. Let's get to it. Hello, you gorgeous humans, you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad that you are here. If this is your first time, welcome. Special shout out to Nigeria for uh, listening. (laughs) I see you, I see you. And if you've been around for a while, I'll give you a big giant hug because you have other things you could be doing with your time and here we are. So in our journey up till now, the last few episodes, We've acknowledged that we are the agents of our own suffering in as much as we believe our thoughts. It's not so much the thoughts that we have, it's the thoughts that we believe that can lead us down the path to suffering. And then I shared with you some tools for how to defuse, to unattach from some of those unhelpful thoughts. One of those tools was interesting point of view. It's just a point of view. What I like about that one is that you can use it when other people's expressions are getting under your skin a little bit. So, you know, someone says to you, you look really stupid in that hairstyle. Interesting point of view. It's just a point of view. And he shared a few other techniques by re-releasing an episode brought from the acceptance and commitment therapy tradition that gives you a few more tools for protecting yourselves from the craziness that your brain can sometimes come up with. What I'd like to do today is to continue on the trend of some practical ideas by sharing with you some of the cognitive distortions that are creating the thoughts that are the most unhelpful. What do I mean by that? Uh, There are no good thoughts, no bad thoughts, no good emotions, no bad emotions. Positive and negative are pretty much meaningless constructs. I know we have a whole positive psychology movement that responded to the pathology psychology movement. And we are told uh, on social media and by other people every day, well, just think positive, think positive, think think positive. I believe that that is a completely unhelpful point of view. In acceptance and commitment therapy and in Dawn's point of view, there are desired states and undesired states There are helpful thoughts and there are unhelpful thoughts. Thoughts are helpful to the degree that they align with reality and help you live in alignment with your values. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today are cognitive distortions that tend to create suffering. One, because they are often not even true. And two, because they are unhelpful, they tend to lead to undesired emotional states very carefully dancing around good and bad, right and wrong, and positive or negative. So let's get into it. So we have some cognitive distortions that have been identified over time. You will begin to notice that they're similar in some kinds of ways. And there are lists that are as few as 10, as many as 15 or 20. This list is pretty comprehensive and will become helpful to you. So number one, of thoughts that you might prefer not to attach to or believe, all or nothing thinking. You look at things in absolute black and white. Either I pass this math test or I'm a complete failure. Either you love me or you hate me. Either you agree with me or you're out to get me. Either you're my religion or you're going to rot in hell. Either you're my nationality or you're a terrorist. I, things are either good or terrible. It's black and white, this or that. It's that desire for certainty often underlies this tendency. I just want to know. So if it's this or that, then I know. A lot of clients will say to me, like, I hate those shades of gray. And a lot of my clients get annoyed with me for pointing out the paradox of both and. It is often this and that to varying degrees. So all or nothing thinking, it's either this or it's that, it's black or it's white, it's good or it's bad, you're with me or you're against me, the either or framing 
can be very unhelpful if you want to live a life in alignment with your values and with a tendency towards desired emotional states. Okay, overgeneralization. You view a negative event as a never ending pattern of defeat. I spilled coffee on myself this morning. Therefore, I'm just going to have a terrible day. My day is ruined. Or my partner broke up with me. I'm going to die alone and be eaten by my cats. Uh, I applied for five jobs. I didn't get any of them. Therefore, I am unhirable. Susan told me I'm stupid, therefore I will never learn anything. You get it, right? Okay, mental filter. You dwell on the negatives and ignore the positives. This one happens so often. It's so often. Hundreds of thousands of things occur to you over the course of a week. What are the things that you remember? And the example that I like to use is someone would walk up to you and go, oh my gosh, your hair is amazing. I love your shirt. Your shoes don't quite work, but girl, you look amazing. And all you hear is, oh my God, Don hated my shoes. I can never pick out shoes over generalization. Either I'm perfectly dressed or I'm ugly. Mental filter, dwelling on the negatives, the undesired opinions and experiences, and completely ignoring anything good, positive that may have occurred. Discounting the positives comes out of this. You insist that your accomplishments or positive qualities don't count. Imposter syndrome much? <laughs> right? Um, you get a promotion, you get an award, and you're like, well, yeah, but I frequently have to stay up all night the night before a deadline because I procrastinate, therefore I'm a terrible worker. That's discounting the positives. Jumping to conclusions, making assumptions. There are a couple of ways this shows up. Jumping to conclusions, A, mind reading. You assume that people are reacting negative to you, negatively to you, when there's no definite evidence for this. You think you know what other people think and you assume the worst. I once had someone confront me about um, giving them a dirty look and why I was mad at them. Uh, I frequently wander around without either glasses or contacts. I did not even see that person, did not notice them at all. And if I had, they would have been a blur. But she assumed that I gave her a dirty look and I had a problem with her. B, fortune telling is another form of jumping to conclusions. You arbitrarily predict things will turn out badly. Uh, this is the what ifs and the playing out scenarios well into the future about how awful, I see, how awful things are gonna be. So um, you get an invitation to go to a party. You're like, oh my God, we go to this party. I'm not gonna know what to say. I'm not gonna know what to wear. People are gonna ask me questions and then I'm gonna look stupid and I'm not gonna have any friends. No one's ever gonna invite me to a party again. And then I'm gonna be alone all by myself for the rest of my life. And then I'm gonna die in, in a ditch and be eaten by cats. Worst case scenario and catast catastrophizing, all of these are in this, this category as well, related to magnification or minimization. You blow things way out of proportion or you shrink the importance inappropriately. Blowing things way out of proportion might look like, my partner didn't replace the toilet paper roll. He hates me and is gonna leave me. And he did that just to get me. Or you shrink things inappropriately. Well, yeah, sure, I drink an entire bottle of wine every night, but that's like no big deal. Everybody drinks wine. Emotional reasoning. You reason from how you feel. I feel like an idiot, so I really must be one. Or I don't feel like doing this, so I'll put it off. It's being ruled by your moods instead of your values. And it relates to all the other ones, like mind reading. So you're like, I feel like an idiot, maybe based on somebody gave me a dirty look, therefore I feel like an idiot, I must be an idiot. Or I feel like eating an entire piece of pie, well, an entire pie, therefore I'm going to eat an entire pie. 
or I don't feel like doing my laundry, so I'm just not going to. Acceptance and commitment therapy points at this one a lot in as much as the invitation is to live according to your values rather than your moods. Do you value being a good parent? Yes. Then maybe you play with your child, even if you don't feel like it, because it's more important to you to live according to your values than according to your moods. Here's one of my favorites, should statements. I think it's Stuart Smalley that talks about shoulding on yourself. You criticize yourself or other people with shoulds or shouldn'ts, musts, oughts, and have tos. Well, they should have asked me what I wanted for dinner and they didn't. Or, oh my God, she shouldn't wear that. Or, well, you have to work a nine to five, which doesn't exist. You have to work an eight to five job. Otherwise you're being completely financially irresponsible. You should be financially responsible. Uh, Oma, you have to, you have to visit your parents at Thanksgiving. Should statements. Well, you should do this and I should do that. And I should go to the gym and I should, 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 should. Lose them never helps. <laughs> never. That's an absolute. <laughs> Labeling. You identify with your shortcomings. Instead of saying, I made a mistake, you tell yourself, I'm a jerk or a fool or a loser. Labeling can get really tricky these days, especially with mental health diagnoses. One of the habits that mental health practitioners have for a long time is calling people by their diagnosis. He's a schizophrenic, she's a borderline. What's happened more recently is we've started labeling ourselves, not only with our shortcomings, but with our, our diagnoses. I'm a diabetic or oh, I'm an idiot, I'm a jerk, oh, I'm so stupid. Instead of noticing your behavior, you identify yourself, you fuse with that label as if it is your identity. And I personally would invite you to abandon all identities. What? Yes. All identities are minimalizing, are minimizing, are, what's the word I'm looking for? Limiting. All identities are limiting. So I'll share an example with you, kind of hanging out a little bit of dirty laundry, but as a black person, as an African-American person, there have been and continue to be any host of unwritten rules about how black people behave. Black people do this, black people don't do that. Um, in the past, one of the things that black people don't do is play tennis. Black people don't play tennis, that's what white people think. Oh, and then along come the Williams sisters. And now it's like, oh, okay, we play tennis now. Or Tiger Woods, like, oh, okay, we golf now. We ski now. Um, you know, that's a, a certain cultural a certain cultural amount of identity and labeling. Because I'm a black person, I can do this and I can't do that. But we do that to ourselves all the time. Um, I have a learning disorder, therefore I can't go to college. Or I'm, I'm a bad learner. I'm, um, I'm a lawyer, I'm a this. Any of those labels can turn themselves into a shortcoming, even if it seems positive on the surface. <laughs> I said positive, I uh, know, even if it seems helpful on the surface. But even more so is calling yourselves names. Oh my God, I'm such a loser, I'm such an idiot. Why can't I, blah, blah, blah. or labeling other people. He's a jerk, she's a B word. Um, oh, he's a terrorist. She's one of those, whatever it is. You get it. I'm beating, I'm beating this into the ground. And then personalization and blame. One of the four agreements is don't think anything, take anything personally. You blame yourself for something you weren't entirely responsible for, or you blame other people and overlook ways that your own attitudes and behavior might contribute to a problem. Kids do this all the time, the personalization. My parents got divorced because I'm terrible. My mother didn't love me because I'm a bad boy. My teachers were mean to me because there's something wrong with me. You're personalizing things that you cannot actually take entire responsibility for. Oh, it's all, that's all my fault. What I see more often is the blaming. 
my life would be great if my husband would stop drinking. It's my boss's fault that I didn't turn in my assignment on time because she didn't give me exactly, she didn't ask me the day before if I was ready or not. Um, it's my mother's fault that I can't hold a job because she was mean to me when I was growing up. It's my sister's fault that we're not talking because she's mean and has no social skills. You catch it, right? So here's a couple of tools for unfusing, defusing, untwisting your thinking so that you can take more valued action and have the tendency to create more desired emotional states. Number one, identify the distortion. Write down, notice your unhelpful negative thoughts so you can see what distortion you're using. When you put it on paper, when you look at it, you can start to unwind from it. So if I notice that I'm feeling unhappy, I can ask myself, well, what am I thinking? Oh, I'm thinking I should be farther ahead by, by now. So I write that down, I'm like, oh, I just should it on myself. So one of the swaps for that particular one I like to share with people is swap could for should. So then you change it to, I could be farther ahead by now. And then next, you wanna examine the evidence. Instead of assuming that your thought is true, Examine the actual evidence for it. For example, if you feel that you never do anything right, you could list several things you've done successfully. Or in the one example that I just gave, I should be farther ahead by now. What's the evidence? Farther ahead means what? Farther ahead than, huh? And then let's try the double standard method. Instead of putting yourself down in a harsh condemning way, Talk to yourself in the same compassionate way you would talk to a friend with a similar problem. We are so mean to ourselves. We say things to ourselves that we would punch somebody in the face if they said to us. And if you're a halfway decent person, would never consider saying to somebody else, you good for nothing loser. What made you think you had a right to, would you talk to somebody else like that? And if you would, let's take a look at that. And if you wouldn't, don't do that to yourself. Talk to yourself like you would a, a beautiful six-year-old child that you love. You would probably say more things like, it's okay, sweetheart. Everyone makes mistakes. Let's see what we can learn from it so we can do better next time. Mm -hmm. The experimental technique. Do an experiment to test the validity of your negative thought. For example, if you have an episode of panic, you become terrified that you're about to die of a heart attack. You could jog or run up and down several flights of stairs and prove to yourself that you are not having a heart attack. Yeah, that's a good one. That's actually a really good one. I feel like I'm gonna die. Okay, prove it. it takes a little courage to try that one. And when you're ready, it's life-changing. Thinking in shades of gray. So people can be a little bit um, hesitant for this because black and white are so clear and so beautiful. But instead of thinking in all or nothing, evaluate things on a range of zero to 100. So when things don't work out as well as you hoped, think about it like as a partial success rather than a complete failure. So um, you did not get first, you did not get the gold medal. Okay, so you could call that a zero as in you completely failed if you're considering a gold medal 100%. Uh, let's say you got a bronze medal. You're like, oh, that was a 75%. Or let's say you didn't medal at all. You could say, well, that's like 50% successful because I actually showed up into the thing. What can I do to bridge the gap between that other 50%? The survey method, use with caution. Ask people questions to find out if your thoughts and attitudes are real realistic. Um, choose wisely. Choose wisely, but you can try it. So let's say you think that being nervous about going to a party full of people you don't know is weird. You're like, oh, I'm so ashamed of myself because I don't like talking to strangers. Ask other people. Do you sometimes get nervous when you have to go to a party and you don't know anyone? They're all going to say, yeah, except for that one super extrovert who's going to be like, no, I get excited. <laughs> uh, the semantic method, I sort of touched on this before. And that substituting language that is less emotionally charged or loaded um, should swap out could or 
I shouldn't have made that mistake. You can say it'd be better if I hadn't made that mistake. And then you can challenge that thought as well. Re-attribution. Attribution is what do you what do you think the cause is? So instead of automatically assuming anything, particularly that you are bad or blaming yourself entirely for a problem, think about all of the factors that could have contributed contributed to it. For example, the whole field of social psychology proves to us over and over and over again how much of our behavior is orchestrated by our environment. Don't believe me? Uh, look up a, a theory about nudging. You are nudged by your environment. Whether or not a room is cold or warm affects your attitude. When you go into a house and you smell chocolate chip cookies, you think more warmly about possibly buying that house than if you walk in and it smells bad. There are a thousand things that contribute to your choices. Not necessarily that you're just stupid. Yeah? And then the good old friend, cost-benefit analysis. List the advantage and disadvantages of your feelings, your thoughts, your behaviors. If, it, if you see that there are more benefits, keep it. Chances are you're living in alignment with your values. But if you see that believing this thought is causing you mostly suffering, consider revising it. Consider revising it. So this is shared from David Burns' uh, Feeling Good Handbook, which is a classic. So well worth looking into. Well worth looking into. All right. I appreciate you for being here. And can I please remind you of something so super duper, uber important? You, beloved human, are whole, perfect, complete just the way you are. And you are worthy and deserving of so much good stuff. So be nice to you, please. Until next time. I am so honored that you share time with me. If you've listened this far, then something here was of value to you. Would you please be a friend of the podcast and share it with at least one other person? The podcast is available on most platforms, including YouTube, and I need your help to get the word out. So please like, subscribe, and share, and a five-star review on iTunes would be chef's kiss. Thank you so much. See you next time.